All right, well, this morning, as I mentioned, we're, we're moving on to uh, the next statement in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, hopefully, it's a little bit of uh, an easier week. Last week, we were talking about the, the descent into hell, and I kind of introduced you to some of the controversy and uh, at least some of the debate around that particular statement, and even the fact that there are some Christians who argue for its removal from the Apostles' Creed. Uh, when it comes to the resurrection of Christ, I don't think there's any Orthodox Christian that's going to argue for the removal of that from the Apostles' Creed. Uh, it's a statement that really lies at the heart of the Christian faith. Um, Craig Blomberg, who's a, a New Testament theologian, he put it this way. He says, no religion stands or falls with a claim about the resurrection of its founder in the way Christianity does. See, the Christian faith it, it literally, it, 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 like it hinges on the resurrection. And without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything else falls apart. So I was wondering this morning, I was wondering how many of you have, have uh, read the book, uh, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel? Or, you know, okay, just to be fair to like, you know, those who are not so much into reading, if you've watched the movie, you can raise your hands as well. How many of so pretty good amount. If, if you're not familiar with, with that particular story, Lee Strobel was a, an investigative journalist with the Chicago Tribune. And uh, he, at one point, his wife converted to Christianity. She became a Christian. And he really, really struggled with this. He was hostile to the Christian faith. And so he kind of made it his mission to use his skills to disprove uh, the Christian faith. He was, he was going to show that it was just a sham. He was going to demonstrate that it was kind of a house of cards. And so at one point, he goes to a colleague of his, Kenny London, uh, who was a Christian, and he, and he kind of asks him, he says, you know, well, I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I want to kind of, I want to pull apart the Christian faith. And he kind of asked him where to start. And Kenny London was fairly convicted about the truth of the gospel, but he said to him, he said, well, if you're going to, if you're going to try and, you know, really pull apart the gospel, you have to start with the resurrection because everything, he said, hinges on the resurrection. And that's just, um, that's just essentially reciting the, the claims of Scripture. So this is something that Paul, we'll read this in just a moment, this is something that Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Paul says there, if the resurrection isn't true, he says, then our faith is futile. In fact, he says in that passage, he says, if the resurrection of Christ is not true, then we of all people are most to be pitied. But I do want to demonstrate today that if the resurrection of Christ is true, then it literally changes everything. And so I want us to think about that today as we go through this, uh, this whole belief in the resurrection, and just about the power it has to, to change everything about our lives. Let's read from 1 Corinthians 15. Let's start there. Um, and I'm just going to read the verses 12 uh, through 19. There we read, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Let's just bring this to the Lord in prayer, and then uh, we'll get started. Father, we thank you uh, just for the opportunity to reflect on the deep truths, the fundamental claims of your word, and also the fundamental claims of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life. Lord, we pray that in this time that we would, that we would think about the truth of the resurrection in a way that, that takes it beyond just the word, beyond just an event, but that also applies it to our own hearts and lives in a way that is transformative, in which we, in which we gain a new perspective on the work that you're doing in our lives and on the work that we pray you do in the lives of so many others. Lord, would you, would you open up our eyes to the truth of the resurrection and the reality of the resurrection, the new life in our lives. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, as I mentioned um, just a moment ago, uh, we're going to look at one of these fundamental claims uh, of the gospel, the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. Now, I should say that when it comes to um, even atheists or skeptics, uh, you'll discover that many of them uh, will have no problem acknowledging the, the reality of the existence of Jesus Christ, the reality of um, the life and the death of Jesus Christ. Bart Ehrman, who's one of the more uh, well-known skeptics, Bart Ehrman says, said this about uh, the existence of Christ. He says, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. The reason for thinking Jesus existed is because he is abundantly attested in early sources. If you want to go where the evidence goes, I think that atheists have done themselves a disservice by jumping on the bandwagon of mysticism, essentially saying that the whole idea of Jesus is just a, a Christian myth. Because frankly, it makes you look foolish to the outside world. If that's what you're going to believe, you just look foolish. Many, like Bart Ehrman, many will acknowledge the reality of the life and the death of Jesus Christ. But what they refuse to acknowledge is the resurrection. And if you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you deny the gospel. And the Apostle Paul, just so you understand, the Apostle Paul was someone who actually found himself in that camp for a lot of his life. The Apostle Paul was someone who would have, uh, who would have acknowledged uh, the, the life of Jesus Christ, that he lived, that he, he, he was an influential teacher, did amazing things, that he died. But what Paul would not acknowledge uh, was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, one day, Acts 9, one day on the Damascus Road, he encounters the risen Christ. And it, and it literally changed everything about his life. It changed his past, his present, his future. And so that's what I want to walk through in our time together today, just thinking about how does the resurrection change us? It changes past, present, and future. And I want to do that again, just kind of walking through the lens of the Heidelberg Catechism. We're in Lord's Day 17 at this point, uh, question and answer uh, 45. And so I want to ask the question. I'm just going to invite you uh, to respond uh, with the answer. And I don't have the question actually right in front of me, but I'm pretty sure I have it, have it close up there. So I think the question is, how does the resurrection of Christ benefit us? Okay, so as I mentioned, I just want to walk through this in terms of how this belief in the resurrection changes our, our view, really, of our past, our present, and our future. And I want to do that a little bit by, by considering the life, actually, the example of the Apostle Paul. So if you're not totally familiar with the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul grew up as a devout Jew, um, not just by name, um, not just by, by birth, but he was someone who was, who was really committed uh, to his faith. We know he, he taught under, or sorry, he learned under the, the teaching of Gamaliel, a renowned uh, Jewish rabbi. He, he committed uh, tons of the Old Testament scripture to memory. He was uh, someone who walked very much in obedience to, to the Mosaic law. So when it came to like being extremely devout, he was a guy who really, uh, he, he really ticked all of the boxes, you could say. And the thing is that the Apostle Paul uh, knew it. If, if you could flip with me to Philippians 3, I want to spend a bit of time in Philippians 3, actually, as we walk through this topic. In Philippians 3, you have the Apostle Paul, and he's actually looking back on his past. So he's looking back on, uh, really, his life uh, growing up. And in verse 4 to 6, he says this. He says, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, 
as to righteousness under the law, blameless. As a Jew, Paul had what you might say was like an immaculate resume. He, he was someone who had done all the things. And yet you have this Acts 9 moment where he encounters the, the resurrected Christ, and suddenly it completely changes the way that he looks at his whole past. All of a sudden, on, on, on that moment, he suddenly realizes that in spite of all of his kind of self-righteousness, he realizes that he's just as far from God as anyone else. And he realizes that the only way that he's going to become righteous is through faith in the risen Christ. And I want to pause here just to apply this doctrine a minute, just to think this through. And I want to ask you, if, if you were to look back on your life, how would you view your past? If you look back, do you see yourself as a sinner? Or do you see yourself as a redeemed saint? Do you, do you look back on your life in terms of all the things that you've done wrong, or when you look back at life, do you view life in terms of what Jesus Christ has done right? I think it's an important question. I can just tell you pastorally, um, I've encountered people, devout people, um, really, really committed, sincere people who, who struggle with their faith who struggle with this idea of whether they've done enough. And often, often it will present itself when they're faced with the prospect with the reality of death. And, and they suddenly kind of look back on their life and they, they wrestle with whether they've, whether they've actually kind of been faithful enough. And in those moments, I think these are exactly when we have to, when we have to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is, this is why the catechism begins with this as the first benefit, right? It, it says these words, I, it says, Christ by his resurrection has overcome death so that he could make us share in his righteousness. The resurrection of Jesus Christ reminds us that we are saved not by, not by our righteousness, but by his. And, and this is something that the Apostle Paul discovered on that, on that Damascus road. And suddenly, when he looked back on his past, it's interesting, if you follow his argument as he goes through, through Philippians 3, as, as he looks back on his past now, he's just talked about his immaculate resume, everything he's done. And then when you get to verse 8, he looks back and he says, I count it as, as, as garbage, I count it as... Uh, literally, I don't know if I should say, but it's not, it, uh, I can't think of an appropriate word. Uh, that's, what, that's how he looks back at his whole past compared to what he now has in Christ. And so you go, okay, well, what is it that he now has in Christ that's so different? Here's what he says. It's, it's righteousness. He says, verse 9, not, not a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. This is, a, this is a righteousness that Christ has obtained by his death and resurrection. And when you, when you believe in the resurrected and risen Christ, when, then, you're, then you're clothed in his righteousness and you're actually given a, a completely new identity. And you're no longer a lost sinner. You, you are a redeemed saint in Jesus Christ. And once in a while, when, when you look around um, at creation, you have, these amazing, you have these amazing examples that God gives us, I think, so that we can understand 
things like the resurrection. I want to use uh, just an illustration this morning from creation. I'm using the illustration of a caterpillar, caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. Okay, so if I can pull up the first picture here. I just want to use this as an illustration. When, when you have a, a caterpillar, you know, a little guy crawls around on the ground, uh, at some point, he attaches to a branch, or she attaches to a branch, okay? It could be either. Um, they wrap themselves in a cocoon, and then something remarkable happens in that cocoon. Somehow, that caterpillar becomes a new creation, right? That caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And the interesting thing is that it, it, it will never go back to being a caterpillar again. And I think that's how we ought to understand the, the belief in the resurrected and risen Jesus Christ. When, when you place your faith in the risen Christ as your Savior, you, you are robed in his righteousness, and you become a new creation. You go from being a lost sinner to being a redeemed saint. And the thing is that you, you never go back again. And if we have that conviction, then it completely changes the way that we look at our past. So that's, that's the impact that the resurrection of Christ has on our past. Let me talk about the impact it has on our present. Because on the one hand, I say in the past, we have a new identity. You know, when we talk about being raised with Christ, we have a new identity in Jesus Christ. But we also begin to live out of that new identity. Lord's Day 17 says this, the second benefit. By his power, we too are raised up to a new life, to something different. And you see that again, if I, if I can refer to Philippians 3, Paul there has looked back on his past, so he's talked about the, the righteousness that he has in Christ, and he's like, my, my whole slate, my whole past has been wiped clean. I have a completely new identity. But he doesn't say, okay, well, now I'm done. That was great. Life is now easy. Instead, the, the rest of Philippians 3 is actually a, a, about his desire to press on. It's like, it's like this... Uh, this language of an athlete pursuing something. He wants to know Christ. He says, I want to know the, the power of his resurrection. In verse 10, he talks about like how I want to share in his suffering. I want to become like him in his death. It's something that he's striving on. If you look at verse 12, it says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Paul sees the power of the resurrection as something that's actually kind of a whole life-changing process. It's not just about enjoying a new identity. It's about enjoying a whole new way of life. And I kind of feel like sometimes Pastor Mark and I have this. We, I feel like this is round two of Pastor Mark's sermon, but we're coming back. Because I want to use that illustration again of, um, of the caterpillar and the butterfly. Let me, let me just give you the second picture of this. So I started with the idea of it spins into a cocoon, something miraculous happens, it becomes, it becomes a new creation. But at the same time, it's not a finished product. And this butterfly begins to emerge from, from this cocoon, and it's actually, it's, it's this whole struggle that it, that it goes through. It takes some time for it to actually, to actually break out of its cocoon. And just a fun fact that you can take home today, um, one of the things that I discovered is that it's in this struggle that, that a butterfly actually gains the ability to fly. It's actually in this struggle that it exerts the energy to, to send fluid in its wings to, to actually fully produce the wings so that it can fly. If you were to, to cut a cocoon to just you know, take away that whole struggle, if you just cut it and let it out, it would walk around. It can't fly. And I think that in some ways we, we can use this to picture the Christian life. You know, when, when we place our faith in the resurrected, the risen Christ, we become, I said, a new creation. But we're also, we're not a finished product. And God takes us through this process called life. And it's filled with hardships, and it's filled with trials and struggles and temptation. 
But, but God uses those to mold us and to shape us into the kind of people that he wants us to be. And if we went through no struggles, if we had no trials, no temptations, the fact is that we would not know like the full power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I do, again, if we just pause to apply this for a second, I just want to add this. I think we need to remember that as Christians, we're a work in progress. Um, again, Pastor Mark kind of stole my analogy, but um, there's grace for that as well. I learned fruit of the Spirit. We're just... But, but I do think the point is relevant in the sense that sometimes we can get so caught up in looking at a single point in our lives, right? Like sometimes, you know, for some, it's you know, really wanting to know, okay, uh, a, like a time of conversion. When, when, was I, when did I really place my faith in Christ? Again, I say for some people, they're going to be very clear on when that happened. But I would say I, I'm, I'm less concerned pastorally in terms of can you identify a specific moment, you know, let's say when the caterpillar turned into the butterfly, when you were... Con- I'm less concerned about a specific moment. I would be more concerned about this, this idea of a timeline. Like, are we seeing growth in Christ? Are, are we seeing um, someone who's, who's more and more being shaped into the character of Christ? I think of Colossians 3, right? If you've been raised with Christ, then put off the old self and put on the new self, becoming more and more created in the image of Jesus Christ. If we've been raised to new life in Christ, then this is the lifelong process of just, just being transformed to be more like Jesus Christ. So that's, that's the perspective we have if we've been raised with Christ. That's the perspective we have of life in the present. Let me just wrap up with the future. So I said, you know, this life is a struggle. It's a battle. Um, and on this side of glory, the transformation is not complete. But the belief in the resurrection tells us that one day it will be. Right? The catechism ends with these words. It says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a sure pledge. It's a guarantee that one day this full transformation will happen. The the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just a belief in redeeming our souls. It's about redeeming our bodies. It's about redeeming this world. It's about a day where there will be no more sin, no more suffering, no more death, no more tears. And and that ought to shape the hope that we have as we look uh, towards the future. And I like the way that Paul finishes in Philippians 3 by driving at this point. He says in verse 20 and 21, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. Right? He's living life here on earth, but his eyes are fixed on Christ, on Christ is where Christ is risen, the language of Colossians 3. Our citizenship in, is in heaven, and from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so just to encourage us, not just to think about the the resurrection as an event historically, but as a life-changing reality, something that, that changes your perspective on the past and the present and the future.